The first thing you ask yourself when a stranger stops you on an empty street corner late at night isn't, who are they? But rather, what do they want? Or maybe you're heading home after a night out with friends, and there's a shadowy figure watching you from a lamppost. But they don't speak. They don't wave. Do you start to feel uneasy? These unsettling feelings come largely from the unknown. The stars beyond our bantam sky are filled with more phenomena than we can possibly count. Maybe that's why the thought of extraterrestrial life unnerves some of us. If they exist, why aren't they speaking? And even if they're talking and we can't yet hear, what do they want? The zoo hypothesis claims that humanity has been deliberately isolated by extraterrestrials and is being observed without interference. To what end? Are they studying us while respecting our right to forge our own future? Or biding their time before initiating some sinister plot? The Fermi Paradox, or Great Silence, refers to the mystery of why those on Earth have not yet made contact with beings from beyond the stars. Do alien civilizations destroy themselves before achieving interstellar travel? Maybe they're even thriving under buried oceans on other planets. Or maybe we're just impatient. But the answers to these questions act only as blinking stars pointing the way toward the biggest question of all. What do they want? Listeners, it's time to consider the extraterrestrial agenda. The idea of a creature larger than a gorilla with an odor like a skunk might seem far-fetched. From the beginning of his time on Earth, man has always been fascinated by monsters, real or imagined. The outside world is very judgmental about these things, uh, with many people not believing in them whatsoever. Cloaked in secrecy, they show up without warning. State their business, then vanish as quickly as they appear. They only land in isolated places. They have taken people, I believe. They do have technology. But the idea is if enough people focus on something, like thousands and thousands of people focus their mind on something and the image, in a very strange way, they can kind of create a real-world version of the, the fictional entity. Fact, fantasy, and history have come together to tease the imagination truth will out and that no one lie can live forever welcome to super normal And welcome to Super Normal, Super NRML. I'm Sean the Fork Chop Forker here this week with Vance Nesbitt, Maz Adams, and Travis Quarter. James Baker may have been abducted and sent to some strange dimension in time and space. Who knows where the hell he's at, but he's not here with us this week. So we will say, as they do in the business, he's on assignment. And Vance, how are you, my friend? I'm going to let you take over this show tonight. Thanks, Sean. And uh, gentlemen, it's good to be in the room with you again Uh, tonight. Of course, it's a very interesting episode that could be thought provoking for years to come. So we're going to open up the show with this. And there it is. So let's take a hypothetical out of Isadora's box, which is similar to Pandora's box. But we're going to call the one I have here Isadora's box. The difference is we can put the subject matter back in the box again, and it does not exist anymore. Unlike, you know, the game of Jumanji, where you had to finish the game in order for everything in reality to go back to what we know as normal. So opening up Isadora's box here, and I pull out a container, that is a factual thing. So once I pull it out of the box and put it on the table, it now becomes fact. So on this glass sealed hermetic sealed jar here it says extraterrestrial life is real 
I'm going to put this on the round table here, and we're going to start this discussion about extraterrestrial agenda and what is the extraterrestrial agenda. And I like that term uh, a lot better than I do alien. Um, alien is more of a larger scope and is not defined enough, at least extraterrestrial. It's something that we don't know about. Could be from another star system. Could be from another uh, plane altogether. Could be interdimensional or extradimensional or whatever the case may be. It may be terrestrial to this planet, and we just haven't discovered it yet. So I would like to start this discussion off by throwing it over to you, Maz. And I know that you've been to the Library of Congress and as a Jewish person yourself, been to the Vatican and gone through their secret libraries, and you've come up with some interesting talking points about the extraterrestrial agenda. So thanks for joining us, Maz. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you. I've definitely been to the Church of Google and the uh, uh, ceremonies of Ask Jeeves. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, UFOs and aliens were one of the, the first main loves or passions that got me into the paranormal. I remember as a child, whenever something would be on, you know, TLC or sci-fi, my mother would tape it, and then I'd watch it over and over and over again. Um, so the, the interest and the love has always been there. And I think if we're going to talk about uh, the extraterrestrial agenda, we should start at the beginning. And, of course, when I say the beginning, I don't mean uh, the beginning of time. Because, as we know, there have been accounts of uh, or references to what appear to be UFOs and chariots in the sky and such. Uh, but I mean in terms of the first real well-documented uh, UFO abduction case. Um, so with that being said, we're going to just go over briefly the story of Barney and Betty Hill. They were an interracial couple, and the story takes place, uh, I believe, the, the late night, September 19th of 1961, into the early morning of September 20th, of course, 1961. And um, basically it's referred to as the Hill abduction or the Zeta Reticuli incident. And it's about uh, Betty, who I believe was a social worker, and Barney, who was uh, a, um, a postal or a postman, uh, quite simply put. And if if you believe that there is validity to abduction stories, or even if you don't, this was really the first one that put abduction, the thought of alien abductions, on the map. Um, so the stories that came after, a lot of them kind of mimic this. But basically, they were driving, I believe, from Canada. Um, to New Hampshire, and they were on kind of like a lonely road. They spotted what looked like a falling star, and before they knew it, it seemed like it was approaching within, I believe, 100 yards or so. And um, they pulled to the side of the road, kind of an overlook, and Barney had binoculars with him, of course. I don't know why you wouldn't. I guess that's the equivalent to having cell phones now. And he was actually able to make out what looked like little beings in the ship. Um, but what makes this case so special, aside from being the first, is that uh, afterwards there were other corroborating kind of events. Uh, they went under hypnosis, were able to recall some events afterwards. Betty had a dress um, that had some kind of pink substance on it that had been tested and was kind of inconclusive. Um, watches stopped working, I believe. Um, Barney had some kind of uh, growth or, or warts, genital warts, something of that matter. Um, but these two people had a lot of credibility and they had a lot to lose, especially growing up, um, you know, being an interracial couple in the 60s. Unfortunately, they were fighting an uphill battle already. And you add on top of this, the ridicule, which which did occur. Um, so I, I tend to believe their validity. I don't know about you, gentlemen. But again, um, it's an unfortunate cross the bear, but they were kind of the beginning. So. To me, that's the best place to start. I think you hit the nail on the head, and it was important for one to mention that they were an interracial couple at that point in time. And why would you report something that would draw even more ridicule to your situation? Do you know what I mean? Uh, that was not just a, a daring move, but very bold. Uh, they've been the basis of, of many inquiries and investigations into the alien abduction. Uh, captured. I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, it's I have. It's amazing. About, it is. It's wonderful. And if uh, listeners, you get a chance to pick it up. It's uh, captured the abduction of uh, Barney and Betty Hill. I think is the title. Was it written by Stanton Friedman? No. Um. I believe it was written by uh, uh, Betty's niece. Yes. Maybe it. Um. 
Kathleen Martin? A hundred percent, yes. Yeah, I think it might have been with like a forward from or help of, but it was definitely her. She she really advocated it. You could find a lot of really um, interesting interviews with her when she was kind of doing the press. And, um, you know, this became Betty's life's journey. And uh, unfortunately, I believe she passed away a few years ago, um, maybe like five years ago now. So her, her uh, Kathleen's really been uh, advocating and, and carrying forward the story. It was written by both Stanton and Kathleen. There you go. <laughs> so yep. we were both were right on, on that, Maz. How about that? But we were also both wrong. <laughs> you were both wrong. <laughs> Thanks for showing the sunny side of that, Absolutely. Mr. Mr. Optimism over here. But you the book it. is fantastic, and Kathleen Martin still uh, is somebody I hold in high esteem and consider her to be an authority. As we know, there's no such thing as experts, but I, I believe her to be an authority on extraterrestrial uh, abduction. And it's well worth it. You can get it on Kindle for $10. We're not getting a kickback, but uh, it's a good book and worth checking out. So I just wanted to add that point. It was really bold of them to come forward with it. Uh, The details about picking up the binoculars and seeing little men in the saucer, I don't know, but it is what it is. Well, Max, you brought up a a couple of really good points. The binoculars is one of them. Uh, I grew up in that era. Actually, I was born in 61. Uh, But growing up in that era... It, my dad had binoculars in the in both his vehicles, and it was kind of the same essential as it is to a smart device that you carry with you today. I it's just how it was, and mind you, too, you know we're coming off of uh, uh, Vietnam. Actually, we're still in Vietnam at that point, coming off the Korean War, and these were tools that that a lot of men came back with. In binoculars, it was just kind of a standard household thing. Uh, nowadays, you really don't find too many households with binoculars, so I, that's very plausible. But you brought up another really interesting point, both of you, um, that this was the beginning of the racial divide in this country and, and the uprising of as an interracial couple. Uh, there were big sides, and, and it wasn't just focused on them, but it took a lot of courage to come forward. So then I thought about that question that you posed, Sean, about why would they have done this if there wasn't any validity to it. The only thing I can come up with, if it was not a actual event, was maybe to bring humankind closer together, that it does not matter what race or creed or religion you are. This could happen to you. But I really don't feel that that was really their motive. I believe what the experience that they've had and all the other accounts and the similar thread amongst all of them that it was a very tangible and very convincing account in which these two experienced. Your thoughts, Travis? Yeah, I agree that um, I don't think there was enough, if if any, motive for them to make something like this up. Because especially back then, it, it would have been, it, it really would have been just foolish to try to place themselves at the middle of a controversial discussion, given their, the fact that they were an interracial couple, especially at that time. Uh, another interesting point about that is I'm looking here on on Wikipedia about how they've they kept going back uh, over and over again to try to see the fiery orb. So it it goes to point out the fact that people who experience this, those who say they experience this, it it affects them on such a deep level that it, I don't think it ever truly leaves them. And that's just it's amazing that that they had the courage to step forth so that we could start actually discussing this topic and looking at it seriously, which I think we need to do. And, you you know, you bring up a great point that I want to get back to in a second, Travis, but it's funny because when I was, you know, researching, even though I was familiar with the story and like Sean said, the book was great. Um, I was even questioning if I should bring in up race because to a certain extent, it has nothing to do with the story, but in another extent, uh, to another extent, it has everything to do with the story because, uh, again, we're, we're trying to co- put this, um, this sighting into context. Literally, this was the first ever so you know as far as being documented um so this like we said this is what everybody else had to go on this was the gold standard and to have that uh, uphill climb that battle with the backdrop of racial tensions you know that was something else but what i wanted to um also point out and comment on what you said travis is that once an event like this happens th- this consumed them this became their identity you know Barney was no longer a postman. Betty was no longer a social worker. She became Betty Hill. He became Barney Hill. The rest of their lives, th- there was no escaping this. So to a certain uh, extent, this was kind of like 
becoming a celebrity there was no separating it and that their their quest for the truth even though they know what they experienced um it just overtook them and i think we owe them a debt of gratitude even though it's not something they wanted um but it really opened up the subject and it's still taboo now all these years later so i can only imagine what it was like then yeah that's a really good point oh, what was it like then and even though this show topic is the extraterrestrial agenda what would have been the point of abducting these two? Uh, and that's where I, I kind of like to look at it as to why did this happen? And and what was the overall motive? And who were they? It, was this a human event that was provoked upon them as an experiment? Or was this an extraterrestrial intervention of some sort? And I would like to get your take on what you think may have been the actual purpose of this type of an abduction? Well, I'll, I guess I'll start. I mean, it seems like it was the pretty typical, you know, separating them and um, running, you know, taking samples and experiments. And obviously if, um, you know, Barney had, I guess, his genitals, something or othered. Um, uh, and if you're looking at it as somebody studying us or trying to collect samples, um, again, they had, you know, an African-American male and a, um, you know, a Caucasian female. So they were able to get two different samples. And I also think the backdrop had a lot to do with it. It's a very lonely stretch of road. There wasn't, there were not too many people around to see it, except that there was, um, apparently some confirmation, um, from the air force that there were, was a craft spotted. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into it more later, especially with other cases, but personally, I feel like, uh, you know, we've been, we're being studied. Um, and uh, from what Betty can recall through uh, hypnosis, it seems like she had vision similar to, uh, or at least in line with that point. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever heard the tapes of the hypnosis tapes? I've, I've heard parts of it. Well, uh, my opinion is uh, in, instinctively to lean toward the idea of of just wanting specimens for study, but in, in terms of why they would want those specific people, I don't know, but I, I can posit a possibility. I'm not saying I agree with this one, but it's a possibility. I'm, I'm looking at, at the fact that Barney, he was employed with the U.S. Postal Service, so you, you had some connection there to um, to the federal level, especially when you look at the fact it says Barney was on the local board of the, uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, maybe the extraterrestrials wanted to be noticed they wanted to to contact and abduct someone who they know would talk um if maybe they want to be found um, i i don't know hmm. it's another really interesting point see there's so many rabbit holes involved here we can go on for probably 36 hours straight just going down all these different rabbit holes which we'll try to stay out of as much as possible but you know again we're abducting two different um human creeds altogether, like you said, Maz, a Caucasian woman, African-American man, and you're taking samples. So what are you doing with these samples? Why are, are we, are, is whatever it is that concerned about our development and what we are? Because I have a feeling that this isn't really the first abduction case. It's the first documented, but this really can't be the first case. I think this has been going on for thousands of years. And, you know, looking back over time in scripture, it seems to have happened quite a number of times. And if people could talk then and document their cases the way we do today, I think we'd really be creeped out and fascinated to find out what some of the either uh, analogies and, and, you know, they tease. It goes back to Whitley Stryber, you know, stating that he was probed. And so now it kind of got categorized that, well, when you get abducted, you get probed. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I really don't think that's necessarily the case. What I have trouble with is why is it that they're looking at us and we all assume that maybe this extraterrestrial race is millions of years advanced. I don't know why we see it that way. I have yet to really hear a plausible explanation as to why we see it as such an, an advanced speed. It maybe they just have something that makes them seem more advanced, but they are looking at us like, wow, they have culture, that they, they have humor, they have emotions, they have love, they have hate. And maybe that is what's driving the force between getting 
samples from us to find out what causes this? I, I don't know. Anybody have any take on that? I'd be interested to hear that too. Well, I think when you go back to Barney and Betty Hill, I didn't get to, you know, kind of opine on that. I think you had two different people uh, in terms of their physical look at the same time, which may be good for sampling, but also intelligent people. They're not, you know, aside from their connection with the Postal you know, Service or the federal government and the United States Commission on Civil Rights, both of them were pretty intelligent people. They weren't, you know, like Tammy and Cletus from the Silver Moon Trailer Park. You know, they're pretty educated people. So that might have something to do with it, too. Now, do extraterrestrials know that these guys work for the federal government or that these guys are involved in civil rights? Probably not. I would almost bank it that if they were in the right place at the right time and they happen to be from a extraterrestrial perspective to what may look to be biologically different people and that might have been the impetus for their abduction. And then for well, the second point, uh, Vance, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. I think we have to look at this as maybe they aren't more highly advanced than we are. Maybe they're just more advanced in certain things. Like maybe they <clears throat> may have uh, the ability to traverse dimensions or, uh, you know, travel faster than light. They may not have the ability to make a cake mix or, or something so simple and basic. Like it all depends on what their needs are, I guess. See, and that's the point that I like, and that's the point that I do like to to bring up because there's only been one other person that actually spoke my thought because I really never had this discussion with anybody in the past. And the only other person that brought up that same type of point was Bob Lazar, is that this might not be a super advanced civilization or race. They may just have an element that that is just, well, it's part of their physics. It's part of their world, whatever that world may be. And, oh, it allows them to do this, which is great. And then they might come here and look at us going, wow, what's this, this orange thing that burns is fire and we have nothing like that this is amazing and we might both be kind of on a similar scale wanting to know a little bit more about each other and if all these photographs which have been claimed as hoaxed and so on about the you know the alien autopsy but what if that's real that was exactly what we would be doing we would be doing an autopsy if we were dead if we were alive i'm sure we'd be taking samples biological samples, study it, figure it out. So we would be doing the exact same thing if we had some sort of an ability to, you know, at least be able to travel to a different location or dimension or whatever it may be to find a civilization. That's exactly what we would do. So you can't really say you blame them for doing that to us. I think um, Vance and Sean, you both make amazing points. Uh, They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but so is intelligence. I think the reason, the overarching reason or overarching reason that I believe in aliens personally uh, is because it's the most believable thing when you compare it to Bigfoot or ghosts or Chupacabra or what have you. The thought that we are alone in the universe, in this vast universe, to me, is far more unbelievable than the thought that we are not. (laughs) So – and it's very – uh, egocentric of us to be- to believe that we're alone, but it's also very egocentric of us to say to 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 put uh, labels on what intelligence is, what what smarts are. We all know people, I'm sure, that can tell you, you know, the year the Civil War began, the year it ended, um, can name all the all the chemical compounds on the periodic table, but they don't have common sense when it comes to uh, everyday things like crossing the road or or turning in a car. So intelligence is completely. Um, you know, uh, person by person basis. So what they may look at us as dumb, just like we look at, you know, uh, lower life forms like uh, ants as as unintelligent. Um, that that may not entirely be true. So it's all who's looking at who, what what the vantage point, what the perspective is. Mm-hmm. And again, that's a really good point. And I know a lot of people use the ant analogy, and they do. And you look at a colony of ants. Each individual has its own specific job to do. And I get that feeling, too, with extraterrestrial abductions, is that every individual of extraterrestrial origin is just to have its own specific job to do without any emotion involved whatsoever. But 
the case is if all these abduction cases throughout history is a human hoax, then that is the bigger story is the human connection creating this hoax that has carried on for years. And that's a better story than an actual extraterrestrial being discovered. So, yeah, that's a good point. You know, we're looking at something that we don't understand and they're probably looking at us and they don't understand. They may know a little bit more now, but they just don't understand. And that leaves that door open as to what is the agenda? What is the final game in this whole process of abduction? Will it come to an end at some point? Is this all part of, you know, human hybridization with an extraterrestrial being? Why? Uh, I, that's something else that I wouldn't understand because I can't see that we would want to, you know, hybrid ourselves, even though there's experiments going on currently. And we're going to do a show on this also called you know, the hybrid. But just as a brief point, why would we want to do that other than to harvest organs for ourselves in another animal instead of having to harvest organs once a person passed away? That sounds all mobile, but it's also kind of creepy, too. So I really am trying to get a grasp on what the whole point is of the agenda. Is it to learn a culture? Is it to learn how the mind thinks, how we do mathematics, how we create a internal combustion engine? And maybe that's their big wow, that we have this scientific ability and understanding in a very short amount of time. Mind you, you know, human existence on this planet is only less than a blink of an eye if you look at the entire time span of this existence of this planet. So, Travis, do you have anything to add as far as, you know, this theory of what the agenda might be? You know. I do have one more possibility that just occurred to me. It it kind of ties in with, with what I'll eventually share here. I had wanted to save it, but since you're asking, I will give you my idea. Okay. Um, it did just occur to me that maybe um, proposing or assuming that these extraterrestrials exist, that maybe they're not adults. Maybe these are children poking a stick at something strange, which could explain why so many of the experiences are so, it just seems so crazy, ludicrous in terms of the visual imagery that we don't see day to day. So it goes along with the idea that maybe they're not as technologically advanced as we make them out to be. Maybe they're not all even adults. Maybe these aren't professionals in whatever field they're in. Maybe these are just people who stumbled upon something and are trying to see, hey, what's this thing over here? Well, that's really, wow, that's a thought I never even gave a consideration to, that it, it may be a very juvenile thought process in all of this. And you, like you said, poking a stick at it. You know, what what do we do with this thing? It is wow. What do you do with it? I don't know. Maybe there is no agenda. That would even be more of a fascinating point if there was no agenda behind all of this. This is just picking and probing and pulling parts out and see you know, what you can find and what you can learn from it. But please, just don't do it to me or to anybody that I know. That's all, all I right. ask because it's one of my greatest fears is, you know, is seeing one out there my bedroom window one night i I just don't want that experience because they're kind of creepy and why do they have to be creepy you know i know that there's plenty of extraterrestrial enthusiasts out there and you know give their whole line of species and there's you know the nordics and then there's the grays and there's the reptilians and i you know uh, that I all that I don't know. I, I don't know. I find it fascinating. I've researched all of that, but you know, it's why do they have to be so creepy looking? Can't you just be really <laughs> serene looking, and I'll be okay with that. Which all leads us back to the whole religious aspect of maybe angels are you know an extraterrestrial being, and oh, they were beautiful and it was lovely. I kind of hope that maybe that would be the case if it is an extraterrestrial. Please pleasant looking don't be this little creepy gray thing with giant eyes staring at me through my window because i'm checking out at that point that's been kind of the basis of some of the um, science fiction television and i don't think we can ignore that you know this all being very popular in in pop culture in that Let's take a look at Babylon 5, one of my favorite sci-fi TV shows. You had two groups of ancient aliens warring amongst each other, and they used the younger races, manipulated them by convincing them in some way that one 
side was good and the other was evil and based upon how their physical forms were that became the basis of at least in humanity angels and demons right so Mm -hmm. you do make a point and i'm sure other people have and of course they must have thought that if they've incorporated in the science fiction manipulation you know have we been through manipulation experimentation taught that these things are, has the fear of them bed in been embedded in us i guess is the question i'm trying to ask have we been genetically manipulated to react to them the way we're supposed to or the way we've been mm-hmm. designed to and then if not and they are really a bunch of extraterrestrial teenage punks poking people and probing them then you know that's funny but it's still kind of nefarious you know what i mean like i don't know it it doesn't bring much comfort even if that's the case that they are intergalactic <laughs> teenagers just going around doing right. their thing all willy-nilly and and thinking it's all right literally so, yeah hopefully that made sense i my my lobes were going back and forth and bouncing some <laughs> ideas around <and laughs> i don't know sense. i just had to get that out there are we conditioned to react the way we do because of manipulation over the perhaps eons we've been visited by these beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's human nature. I mean, to think that there could be these things out there that once, number one, once we're tagged, doesn't matter where we are. There's no hiding. They could come get us whenever we want. That is the scariest thought uh, there is. And I, I, I think another part of it is the, the whole uncanny Valley kind of thing. You know, the thought that when something looks, the closer something looks to being human but still not being quite human, it's unsettling. Um, so regardless whether they mean well or not, uh, it's a scary thought. The, the knowing that at any time, doesn't matter if you're locked safe somewhere in your home, uh, and then knowing that people's minds can be wiped of it and they can't remember and they won't be able to see what's going on, that's literally the scariest thing. You know, People are afraid of uh, home invaders or things like that, but it can be one and done But with this. There's literally no escape, and once you've been marked and given the kiss of death, I mean, there's – and just the, the thought of, uh, Sean, of uh, little punks running around, it, it's funny, and that that was an interesting port, uh, point that you brought up, Travis, uh, because there are a lot of reports that there are like um, – there usually seems to be somebody who's in charge and others that are doing kind of work, and I, I when I brought up the ant analogy, I didn't even realize how kind of – you know, how dead on that was. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Sean, you bring up a good point. You know, is it in a DNA uh, genome with us? And I think since birth, you know, we're, we just we follow the normal human existence through school, through parenting, uh, being taught. But we're never taught of another bipedal anything. We are the only bipedals that we know of and we're comfortable with that. So even to interlink that with the Sasquatch community, you see something bipedal, you see an alien creature that's bipedal, that somehow throws you for a loop that is just unexpected, completely unexpected, and it could be very terrifying. What's your thought, Sean? Well, I I think we go back to, like you said, conditioning, and has this been you know, genetically imported into us. And sometimes I think you guys know the experience of deja vu, man, I've, I've done this exact thing and exact thing. And I really, you can't explain it, but you know, it's happened or you've experienced things, but you don't know how you've experienced them. And I make, I wonder if memory is one of those things that's passed down through DNA, like, to somehow our bodies or minds retain that and pass those emotions or feelings or senses down through the genetic code. Uh, And that's what the experience of deja vu really is. And if so, is that something that can be manipulated by these extraterrestrial beings? And could they use it for for conditioning purposes? I don't know. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I you scientifically, yes, there is genetic changes that have happened over millennia in the human species and along with the animal species, too. It all has DNA coding that gives reference to you, you doing certain things. We refer to it in the animal kingdom. You know, it's 
just what's the term? It, it's you know wh- when you just have to go do this. It's instinctual. That's the word I was looking for. Instinct, and that's what drives the animal kingdom. It's all followed by instinct. Well, that instinct comes from the genome, and it is scientifically proven that's how that works. So if the genes are being manipulated by an extraterrestrial source, that in itself gets a little too defined, in in just my personal opinion, that's a little too defined and a little too evasive to me and to the human race to go to that point because we now have no control over our future generations if they deem to change that human race to their manipulation. And to me, that's not a good thing. That seems to be more on the evil side. Well, let's get the good extraterrestrials in there to have that lightsaber fight and stop that from happening because we're going along the path that we choose. Don't take away our free will because that's one of the strongest tools that the human race has is free will. Don't take that away. And I think that's part of what the terror is behind all of this. And, you know, when you're a child, I was was a really young boy when I saw... Uh, unidentified flying craft. And I stood there in the backyard with both my mom and dad, and we watched this for 45 minutes. We had no idea what we were staring at. But when the event was over, I looked at my mom, and she had both hands covered over her mouth. I knew immediately that it impacted her much worse than it impacted me because she couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. My dad couldn't figure it out either. And uh, the funny thing is, we don't really remember a whole lot of conversation about that event afterwards. We saw it, and we just kind of moved on with our life and tried to erase what happened. I'm not saying we were abducted. No, we were not. It's just you kind of push it out of the way because it was too bizarre to kind of wrap your mind around at that time. Who's got a thought? Ouch. <laughs> Brains. Oh, zombies are later on in the That's season. Right. I'm sure we all have multiple thoughts, uh, but who wants to share them? Who is going to be the Barney and the Betty Hill of this uh, group here? Well, Vance, how old were you when you had your your sighting? Seven. Seven, so that was in 1968. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, good year, Planet Mm -hmm. of the Apes. Mm -hmm. Get your hands off me, you dirty... Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's a family-friendly show. But now, have you had... (laughs) Yeah, listen here, Miss Isabella's Box, okay? Mm-hmm. We, uh, <laughs> I love that movie, by the way. I would. Uh, I saw that when I was seven, too. Did you, mm. did you have any subsequent encounters with flying saucers or flying objects afterwards? I say flying saucers. I don't mean that to be ignorant. I just used it as the... No, no, no. Term. No, I understand. Um, I have seen uh, three times after that, but my eyes are to the sky a lot. Uh, and a lot more than I think the general population does. Yes, there are enthusiasts that do look for, you know, UAPs, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena. And I'm one of those. And three other times I have seen very questionable things that just move in a way that just it's under intelligent design. I just I I don't know what it was. The last event that I saw, um, I was fortunate enough. Actually, all the times that I had seen something, I was fortunate to have somebody with me at the time, which leads credibility because they saw the same thing I'm witnessing, too. The last event really kind of freaked out the person that I was with and ended up dialing 911 because he thought this was the invasion. And there were six that were horizontal, and these were red orbs. And right outside the window in which I'm sitting at, six orbs, red that were horizontal and four of them that were vertical in a, in a L shape as you were to lay it down. And one by one, the ones that were vertical just ascended and followed the track of the other one over a period of maybe 45 to 50 seconds until they were out of sight. The six that were horizontal shot off to the east toward Chicago at breakneck speed one right after another, like you were firing a gun. It was the craziest thing. This was not any type of drone. They don't move that fast. These were totally silent. I would only guess that they were probably maybe a half a mile from me, but I 
I can't specify that because it's really hard to judge size when you're looking at something in the sky. It could have been 12 miles away for all I know, but I just got the feeling that it was probably a lot closer proximity. But yeah, I have seen things, but you know, as far as uh, a close encounter of the fourth kind, no, no. Mm -mm. And I wasn't really that scared on the last one at all. I was more interested and concerned it kind of gets your adrenaline going, believe me. Totally. But, but, you know, it, to see, to see it, you know, yeah, I want to see more. I do want to see more as long as I keep my distance. I, I don't want to see what's inside the craft. Thank you, no. <laughs> Speaking of more, um, Travis, do you have any uh, other research that you came across or any other stories that might um, illuminate your thoughts on the alien agenda? Oh, actually, uh, I did. I found uh, an interesting article from... From 2008, this was on uh, MD Edge uh, website. It's presented by Clinical Psychiatry News. Now, the article was written by a Dr. Patricia Kin, MD, and a Dr. Vena Bonneau. Kin is a fellow with the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychology at the University of Louisville, while Dr. Bonneau is an associate psychiatry professor at West Virginia University. Kin is the one who's actually talking about the patient she treated. Now, this patient was named, um, they call her Ms. S., now, she was uh, age 55, unemployed, lived with her teenage daughter and elderly mother. Now, Ms. S., she, she presented with these symptoms that indicated depression, anxiety, hoarding, chronic sleep problems, and she was having difficulty concentrating. So, I mean, none of that's too weird in terms of what we're talking about. So what Clint did was she prescribed some medications to help with all of those things, and uh, it helped a little bit, but Ms. S. continued to have sleep trouble. And she revealed one day, after establishing a rapport with Dr. Kin, that she had had perpetual encounters with extraterrestrials since she was three years old. Now, she said she hadn't experienced an encounter like that in the past five years. But because of that fear, uh, Ms. S. said that she would sleep during the daytime because she wanted to protect her family. She thought that, that the extraterrestrials might be targeting her family. In terms of one of the chilling experiences that she recalls, Ms. S., uh, she said she was lying awake in bed and looked up to see this jeweled spider descending from the ceiling with a drill that she heard. And the spider's legs opened, and Ms. S. says that she recalled feeling the drill, but it didn't cause any painful sensation. And she also spoke of similar encounters like communicating with the aliens, uh, examinations, and even childbirth. But the resulting PTSD, which the doctor did acknowledge in this report, led Ms. S. to a group of others who were allegedly affected by an AAE, alien abduction event, of course, and she found some solace there among those people. But the belief that her family might be in danger is why she was always sleeping during the daytime and staying awake at night. Now, curiously, not every memory of these encounters is negative, though. Ms. S. actually added that she, uh, she thought aliens gave her a gift as a child by actually like helping her with her excel at mathematics, which is curious to find some type of positive spin to this thing. Although her summaries were vivid, it was stated that Ms. S. cannot draw what the aliens looked like, and that pictures of the gray aliens caused her to panic. Now, going back to this jeweled spider thing, it's, it's interesting to note the role, I think, that sleep paralysis can play in the things we sometimes see when we wake up or fall asleep. And Dr. Kin says that in a recent study, hallucinations were reported by 5% of those experiencing sleep paralysis. And she said that these sensations typically feature either some form of demon or a sense of a villain from a movie, something like that. Now, what I find very interesting about this is that psychosis and false memory linked to sexual abuse. Those were things that Dr. Kin considered and found no trace of those whatsoever. Dr. Kin finally settled on a diagnosis of sleep paralysis, which is not treatable by any FDA-approved drug. And Dr. Kin uh, decided to, to just keep treating Ms. S. the way that, that Kin had been. And Dr. Kin actually adds to this that a year later, though Ms. S. did see improvements from the medication and no longer suffered from sleep paralysis, she still had sleeping difficulties, and her new psychiatrist was reportedly pursuing a potential course of treatment for a, quote, bipolar component of her mood disorder, end quote. So my conclusion to that is that 
uh, a few questions. If aliens contacted Ms. S, why did they do so? Uh, I'll throw it to you guys. Yeah, well, wow. The whole jeweled spider thing, if that's not just a creep factor within itself and then have this drill device and not feel any pain. I just wanted to scream. You know, exactly. You just want to scream and and just end it all right then and there. So, I don't know, these this, this whole terror thing, stop with the terror thing. If you want to know something about me, please sit down in a chair across from me and I'll let you know anything you want to know. But when it comes to physical contact without willingness, no, no, I'm no, I, I can't say no. <laughs> Just no. You know, what concerns me the most about all this is how we treat experiencers of alien abduction. One, they're treated like they have a mental illness, which is bothersome. Um, not because it's necessarily wrong, but why do we approach it as a fairy tale still when there are case studies of people reporting the same activity and behaviors from strange beings abducting them from their homes? Mm-hmm. And, and then well, we treat them like they're crazy. We give them drugs. We uh, can blame everything else. And maybe eventually they do go a little crazy, but any experiencer from, from something traumatic has that potential to have paranoia, uh, develop other mental issues, uh, depression, sleeping issues, which also will cause other mental issues. Why do we treat it like they're the ones that have the mental issue instead of the event being the trigger, not the person themselves? That's the problem I have with it. Well, yes. yeah, I'd hate to use this comparison, but when, uh, when, when you were talking before, Vance, it kind of reminded me of it. You know, being uh, taken against your will or being forcibly, you know, being forced upon against your will. I can't help but think there are a lot of similarities between people who have been victims of rape and, and this, not to trivialize either of them. But um, when you look at what, what a stigma there is against something that we know exists in society and runs prevalent, uh, like rape, <laughs> and people are afraid to come forward with something like that where we know for a fact that it's happened. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then you have something like alien abductions where there is still a large amount of people that even if they believe in life on other planets, they don't believe in little green men coming and probing people. So, um, right. it's just, it's just right. a hard jump in logic. Um, when you, when you look at the pe- people that have suffered things that we know are real, um, and the, the stigma they face, you can only imagine what the stigma would be. Mm-hmm. Travis, I'll throw it over to you, but I would just want to make a point in in the case study in which you just got done reading to all of us, which is fascinating. That is not the first case where something more was gained from this person. Uh, they excel or she excelled in math. But there, I've heard other cases, too, where this person that was abducted or had whatever experimentations done upon them knew how to speak fluent Portuguese. That just doesn't happen. And, you know, Sean, you bring up a really good point. We, we consider these people crazy first, but take a look at it going, hmm, now I'm sure there are cases out there where that is the case because I think it's a scapegoat. And, well, it's the alien thing, and, and that's that scapegoat. So how do we weed through that, of which is an actual case and what case is just being used as either pure dementia or a scapegoat. Yeah. I mean, before I throw it over to Travis, or you throw it over to Travis, or somebody's throwing something to Travis. Uh, you mm. know, who, Cash. Who, yes. <laughs> Heads up. Who ever uses extraterrestrials as a reason to rob a bank or to, uh, I guess they've used it to commit murder more recently, but, you know, why haven't they used it to justify other terrible things that people have done, violent crimes? Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Why is it when somebody reports something so traumatic, and as I typed in our little host pod violation uh Mm imagine you made the comparison that you know a sexual assault sometimes these people are sexually assaulted their persons are violated without their permission they're being taken from their place of comfort into some extra space or vehicle and some terrifying things are being done why do we treat those people like they're the ones with mental issues as opposed to really dialing down and treating the symptom 
not making them the symptom, I guess. And we're not going to answer that question. It's, it's not while we're here, but it's just a frustration I share from people that do report this stuff. And I, I feel for them. I may not necessarily believe every one of them, but I still feel for, feel for them because in their minds, they've experienced this, and that's truly terrifying. And, Sean, to your point about uh, how the medical community reacts to this, I do find it very unfortunate that – the initial reaction that Dr. Kin had to hearing about these extraterrestrial encounters was to figure out if there was a false memory of sexual abuse or if there was some type of psychosis. It just it kind of boggled my mind that that she would that any doctor yeah. would immediately disregard the possibility that this could be real. And there's one key reason for this for me. It's the lack of a single blanket diagnosis mm -hmm. for those who experience this stuff. There's not any single thing that the DSM-4 points to that says those who claim to be abducted by aliens or extraterrestrials, this is why. It's just not there. And, and you even see all these cases where they're treated however the doctor thinks they should be, and it doesn't change that fear, and it doesn't change that memory. No. And we're learning more about the human mind every day. And uh, even recently, if, if you watch the documentary The Keepers, on which is not anything related to this aside from victims of assault and survivors of assault uh you know memory is a powerful thing and we really still don't understand how it works and how people that suffer through traumatic things can car um, compartmentalize this and bury it until something happens one day and it kind of activates that memory and then they experience that terror all over again kind of the same idea with uh with this in a, you know, more, I don't know, I guess because it's extraterrestrial to me, it's a little bit more terrifying, I guess. Yeah. It's terrifying. Big enough word. There we go again. I guess it's the and, first word that comes to mind, Vance. Maybe not the right word, but uh, it's the first word right, that comes to mind. Right. And it's scary. Uh, no, it's scary. And, you know, I do appreciate the, the whole violation thing because that's exactly what it is. It's it is. a violation against your will. And, you know, whatever these beings are, you, you can't do that. They do it, but you just can't do that. But we're almost being hypocritical when we say that because we do it with our nature around us every Absolutely. single day. We tag every freaking animal out there. We want to monitor. We want to scoop from them. We want to take DNA samples. So how are we being? Maybe this is our punishment. I don't know. I don't, know. I, I don't know. I think that. But no. We ponder yeah. those things. Let's take a moment here and uh, talk about something exciting, and that's the fact that we're socially active here on Super NRML. You can find us on Facebook uh, at Super Normal Cast because for some reason Facebook won't let us use Super NRML. Join the Super Normal Forces and become one with us online, and we're on there every day. We love to interact with our listeners and our friends, and we have a good time. You don't want to miss any news or information regarding Super NRML. And again, you find it on Facebook, Super Normal Cast, on Twitter, at Super NRML, and on Instagram, which is also at Super Normal Cast. And uh, we're getting better with the social media every day. We enjoy it. You can find us, connect with us, and we're going to have a good old time on there talking about these topics such as tonight and we always encourage you to not just you know give us your you know once and done opinion but continually connect with us and let us know what you feel on all these topics send us a voice message and we'll play it on the show we want our listeners to uh really be immersed in the uh super normal experience and that's what we're creating here for you through social media vance yes back to you well, here's my next thought uh, for all of you gentlemen, and I'll start the, that, this part of the discussion off. My, my first experience with an abduction case was the Betty and Barney Hill case. Uh, however, when I heard that case, I, mind you, I was a kid at the time, so I really only got the surface of it. I didn't understand the in-depth part of the story until years later, but it kind of got pushed to the back of the room and didn't pay much attention to it until my mother handed me the book called Communion by Willie Strieber. And I got probably one third of the way through that book. I was a little creeped out about, you know, the UFO over the cabin thing. And then the movie came out. And when the movie came out, it was Christopher Walken that played the role of 
Whitley Strieber. And I know there's a lot of controversy around his whole story, whether it's believable or not. The point is it was the story at the time. And that was really the first case that came to the forefront for me to get involved in what abduction cases were. And I'm interested for the rest of the room, what was the first case that you can remember, recall, whatever the case may be, about an abduction case that captivated your imagination as? Uh, for me, it's probably the big bad. And it's not uh, its not really abduction, so I don't know if I'm cheating, but uh, as much as the <laughs> the Hill abduction uh, case is, is the godfather, so to speak, of abductions, as far as UFOs go, uh, of course, it was July 1947 in Roswell, and it's the, still the case or the the scenario that interests me the most. It just it, there's been a million books on it, and I just can't get enough of it. Um, just the whole story behind it, and the backpedaling, and the the fear and intimidation. Uh, uh, it's just the 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 you know the the supposed which you referred to before um, alien autopsy video. Um, just I remember even buying that from like Suncoast Video as a kid. Um, mm-hmm. And just that stuff to me is so fascinating. I mean, there's no place in america that you hear and the first thing you think of is ufo aside from roswell you hear roswell that's the first thing you think of is aliens and that's that's powerful and it 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 engrossed me uh in the subject and like i said today it still remains a mystery and it just it it, the more time that goes on the more people have passed away the less we're going to be able to know about it but Mm -hmm. it's just it's like kind of the gift that keeps on giving travis do you recall your first uh acknowledgement or first interest into an abduction case that really captivated you now for me i've never actually been introduced to an abduction case until this first one i researched tonight but in terms of the existence of extraterrestrials and the idea of that for me it it started as it may have for for several people it was through cinema um when i was young i saw of course that movie space invaders which i only (laughs) bring that up because that's the earliest one that i can remember seeing uh but but throughout my childhood and my adolescence, I was fascinated with extraterrestrials. Uh, I remember my dad and I came up with this nice little uh, audio cassette tape series we pretended was a TV show about two alien friends. And uh, I loved the, the Men in Black movies, that kind of thing. X-Files really spoke to me. It's just – it's been this feeling for a long time for me that these beings are real. And my dad did believe in them, and he did – I mean he did make that known. He used to read books by – former like CIA operatives, people who were who had had jobs in government that then went on to write books about this. So mm-hmm. it's just it's been a long time fascination for me just because that piece of the unknown for some reason really draws me. Sean, what's your take? What's your first uh, recollection of an abduction case or alien or I'm sorry, extraterrestrial agenda case or whatever pop culture thing at the time that really brought it to the front uh, well, forefront was- for you? I was sort of baptized into the world of the strange and the bizarre. Uh, You know, most people that have followed me through my shows know my background and my story. I grew up where we talked about the paranormal, unexplained, unusual, uh, as if it was just part of everyday life. My my family was really immersed in it. So I was kind of born into the culture of uh, the supernatural and and the unknown. But I think my first experience with alien abduction was probably Travis Walton. And uh, his story of being abducted and actually seeing uh, the abduction by his co-workers that took polygraphs and passed. I think only one of them took one and it was inconclusive, which didn't mean he was mm-hmm. lying. Um, that, that was a fascinating story for me. And, of course, we didn't want to turn this whole show into alien abductions, but it's a huge part of the agenda, right? Like, there's a reason mm-hmm. they're taking us. Why? Mm-hmm. And, and we may not answer. And I think for the listeners that think that we're going to be able to do that one you're naive but two uh it, it, it perpetuates the question and that's what we want to do we're discussing these things for the sake of discussion i guess the first experience i had with extraterrestrials was alf alien yeah life, right oh yeah uh and i'll post a picture in the super normal chat of me and my alf doll that uh, mm-hmm. i got for christmas one year because that was you know from the planet melmac and Mm-hmm. That was my first, you know, pop culturalist experience. E.T., of course, was was big. And I, I think E.T. was probably, I think as much as it was a good kids movie, it scared the hell out of me. Oh, yeah. It was mm-hmm. scary. Um, 
And I, I have to mention, if we're speaking about movies, uh, first off, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind is a huge one. And I'm sure you guys want to talk about that in a second. But we have to mention Mac and Me. Uh, maybe it was my age. Reason it was a Jesus. terrible E.T. ripoff. Exactly. <laughs> so, but it, I just remember renting that thing from Blockbuster over and over again. And it's crazy how how many references there are in pop culture and how we all have connections, whether it's Star Wars or Men in Black or Close Encounters. And there are, you know, we it's weird because we do have good feelings about this this topic, no matter how disturbing or or scary it is. And it's it's almost like one of those things you don't want to encounter, but you do at the same time. At least for me, I kind of feel that way. No, I'm with mm-hmm. you. I, I totally agree with you on that train of thought. And uh, I think you can't help but look at the iconic gray and not grin unless you're Vance and you want to wet yourself and hide, but <laughs> you look at that, that kind of iconic gray uh, as the pop cultural icon of extraterrestrials mm. now, right? But we know there's far right. more than just grays out there. There are aliens that are far more horrifying and scary. Lizard people, the reptilians, the insectoids. So, like, we could go on mm-hmm. here for, you know, according to some people, there's over 20 different types of extraterrestrials that visit planet Earth. But I think when, if you listen to the primer of the show, Travis's question, what do they want? Uh, and he asks in such a very compelling way, that's where the horror lies. I don't think it lies from their physical appearance. That it comes from the mystery of not knowing what they want. And mm-hmm. I think maybe as a species, we're just geared to lean towards the negative. But... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to steal Travis's thunder. I don't know if he had anything else you wanted to talk about there uh, and, and Vance, where you wanted to go with this next. I know I have a case or a, a couple of theories to talk about, but we can move mm-hmm. on from that when you guys are finished. Well, I, I find it interesting that Hollywood does does focus a lot more on, you know, the friendship, the kinship and the mystery of it. But they really don't focus too much on the abduction of it. And I think that's what Fire in the Sky, which is the Travis Walton story, uh, was so impactful because that's really one of the very first uh, cultural iconic movies that represented this horrifying abduction. And what was the point what was the final point? Now, all you knew is that he was dropped off naked in nowhere. And, and why? Why did that happen? Now, I understood he fought against it, and I would fight against it, too. You can't do this. Again, it's going back to the violation thing. But, you know, there's not really a whole lot of Hollywood movies that are made that are really representing an abduction unless it's put into the horror genre. Well, and Close Encounters of the Third yeah. Kind tried to... Uh, that movie was frightening. That That's not a feel-good movie. That's a scary-as-hell movie. Uh, right, but it ended up as a feel-good movie. That's yeah. the thing. I didn't feel good at the end of it, whatever, <laughs> but... It, well, <laughs> eh, you know, I mean, hey, the kid came back and, and Richard Dreyfuss, you know, left Chase and Joss to go ride on a spaceship. So, you know, it, 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 it did kind of end up on, you know, a positive note. Is not positive. No, okay. You Travis, can take it that way. That's fine. <laughs> Travis, you wanted to speak? But to me, just getting onto the uh, the fire in the sky in the Walton case, because I remember seeing that trailer and scared the bejesus out of me, even though I was into aliens. But the most uh, interesting thing in that case was the fact that he went disappearing for or missing for days and that he was actually um, – <laughs> Uh, the 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 coworkers were actually you know being questioned by the police because he was missing, uh, wondering about his murder, and then he just shows up at a gas station. That to mm-hmm. me, that's the craziest part um, as far as mm-hmm. corroborating the story. But uh, yeah, I, I just remember whereas Bigfoot kind of had a renaissance a few years ago with finding Bigfoot and becoming um, this icon in pop culture in like the late '90s. It was all about uh, I think around when Independence Day came out. There was alien this and alien that. It was like everywhere. So there's right. always been this, this fascination. And what fascinates us scares us. Mm. Okay, Travis? Yeah, speaking to that, I, the idea, the fact that what fascinates us can scare us so much, that's interesting to me because so many of these reported events are seen as having some type of violent undertone or some type of threatening undertone. And I, I think in large part that has to do with the fact that you're dealing with the unknown. I was sitting here thinking, you know, for, for, for any encounter that doesn't involve 
what what some say are, are probes or doesn't involve more physical violation what is it that scares people and and it occurred to me that it could simply be the unknown if you take anybody any person uh, whose face you don't see and they kidnap you from somewhere you're going to be terrified which points to the the fact that that alone is enough to to scare us now what i wonder about is how malicious extraterrestrials are if there's no and i don't know cuz i haven't looked at different cases but i'm not aware of any cases where different um, people who encountered them claimed attempted murder, for instance, that they were trying to kill them. Uh, and and I find that very interesting. Of course, they're horribly violated. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly admit that. But in terms of it, the, the idea of attempted murder makes me curious just because we don't know their agenda. So who's to say it's completely malicious what they're mm-hmm. doing or, or to their minds what it is or just for a slight little potential detour? Uh, who are we to say what their ethical – compass looks like right and i find it interesting with all these cases too there is communication and a lot of these cases there's you know the telepathic communication or a communication of another sort but there are understood communication between the extraterrestrial and the human species so why can't you just explain what it is that you want but sean i wanted to hear what your point was before we took travis's comments there you know, we talk about what do these beings want with us, right? And we have, uh, you know, there's a multitude of theories out there. Uh, you know, are they really, and I'll edit this out, don't worry, there's some extraneous pauses in there. Uh, what do they believe the ETs are visiting us for, I guess, really? Uh, potentially for a couple purposes that I think that they're they're coming here for. One, maybe our resources. Maybe we have resources they don't have back on their planet and they just want to help themselves to our uh, flora, fauna, or whatever else they can get our hands on, our genetic material. Uh, Are they using us as food sources? Are we the... uh, (laughs) It's a cookbook! We're we're the the soil and green. Are we the intergalactic (laughs) version of the Big Mac, right? That's uh, that's a thought that's going to keep us up tonight. Or do they just want to... More of the McDouble. Continue... (laughs) keeping the uh you know human race in check to keep us as eventual servitude race and that one kind of scares me a little bit more Mm -hmm. than than what we've dealt with but if they are uh here and they are doing things think about this how many people go missing every year that vanish without a trace Mm -hmm. you know seven david polites has made a whole book series on it called the missing right and yeah. uh, even though I don't believe he draws a connection to extraterrestrials, how many times have you guys heard, or maybe you haven't heard of the theory that there's an armistice sign with the governments of the world, with extraterrestrials, that X amount of people are able to be taken each year in exchange mm-hmm. for advancements in technology? Mm-hmm. Have you heard well, that, that sucks. before? I have yes, yeah, so I, believe, I believe that that came about during the Eisenhower presidential administration. And that's where that started at. Is that um, a conspiracy theory? It could be, it could be factual. Well, that could be too, but it seemed like these missing person cases became much more documented from that era and up to present day. Whereas prior to that missing person cases, yes, they did happen because of uh, yeah, human cases you know, malicious human cases where people would go missing. But now you have all these undocumented, unsolved mysteries of where did these people go? And that's where that whole thing started was in the Eisenhower administration that this was a trade-off as part of building the industrial, military industrial complex. And the trade-off was, well, you can have, you know, so many humans in exchange for, technological advances and it's funny today we have devices that we can communicate and find out any kind of information from anywhere around the world and do a podcast that we couldn't do 20 years ago so you know does it lead credence to it it's quite possible i pray that that's not the case and you know there's a lot of those that are you know in the camp that look the extraterrestrial race is actually you know the great architect of life on this planet Well, that's kind of creepy, too, because that throws all religion right out the window. 
And what does that do to the human race when it comes to the fact that, you know, religion is no longer really relevant anymore? It's just kind of an internal anarchy that you're going to create. So these points can get really deep into the rabbit holes with a lot of speculation. But again, it all goes back to why abduction and why would you want to medically probe involuntarily what is what's the point and like you said you know okay an intergalactic big mac yeah that's pretty terrifying hopefully it's for a much more you know, peaceful resolution but i'm starting to think maybe it's not I, I don't know maz do you have a thought on that yeah just two quick thoughts i wanted to make or, or comments back to what travis said about how you've never heard uh, attempted murder I think maybe it's because there is no such thing as attempted murder. If aliens want to kill you, they kill you, and that kind of feeds into what you were just talking about, Vance. Um, I mean, it's not like you have anywhere to run. It's not a. It's not like you you can run to a car and drive away if you're being taken into space. Um, and especially if they can control your body and sedate you, uh, I think if they want you dead, you're pretty much going to be dead. And my second point was when you guys were talking about, well, what is the agenda? Are they good? Are they bad? I mean, why can't they – what makes you think they're any different than the human race? They don't all have to be on the same page. So maybe there are those that are altruistic and want to uh, make sure that our race lives on, and maybe there are some that want the opposite and want to stifle us and, and put out our flame. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. Well, this gets deep, and this is the thing. Mm-hmm. This is – before we went off in your guys' little segue there, this is – there's a multiple components to this that uh, are, are really when you – and I've said this before about other things, innocuously when you plant little suggestions and they may not be that bad, but when you put them all together, this combination of these little innocuous little seed plants become very nefarious. And that's where we end up. You know, we talk about the agenda. What is the agenda? Have you guys heard of United Nations Agenda 21? No, I know I've Forever 21. It, I, yeah. <laughs> so, nice necklaces. It's- Nice. Agenda 21 was a United Nations initiative, and it's actually a 350-page document divided into uh, four sections. And uh, I went over these with Travis the other night independently, and and there are four sections. Section 1 is social and economic dimensions, which uh, directed towards combating poverty, changing consumption patterns, promoting health, achieving a more sustainable population. That's verbatim. Achieving a more sustainable population and sustainable mm-hmm. sustainable settlement and decision making. Section 2. Conservation and management of resources for development includes atmospheric protection, combating deforestation, protecting fragile environments, conservation of biological diversity, Control of pollution and the management of biotechnology. Starts to get right. a little deep, right? Section 3 is mm-hmm. a little bit about strengthening the role of major groups, including the indigenous people. Uh, but Section 4 is the means of imp- implementation where they use science and technology to really bring this about. But then I'm going to quote Jim Mars here after we've just talked about that little overview of Agenda 21 and the late Jim Mars. Quotes, the wealthy elite operating at the expense of the tax paying public would want to gain control of our presses any uh, of or suppress any alien technology that might unbalance the status quo and threaten the monopolies of energy communications or health care. Now, you could take that a little further, guys, and say it's not the wealthy elite. There may not be a wealthy elite. What if the wealthy elite is actually already influenced by the extraterrestrials? Mm -hmm. So now this Agenda 21, which is put into place by the leaders of the free world, which, by the way, Agenda 21, uh, we signed it as the United States, but it was never discussed or debated in Senate. This stuff is just now there. Like, do we really have to go and look any further than our own laws and initiatives that kind of we purposefully set up the situation where we can be controlled easily or we're already being controlled. Right. Well, keep in mind, too, this was United Nations. Okay, so it doesn't have to go before Congress in order to have a declaration or any kind of treaty to be signed and enforced. 
it's all under United Nations, then I think that's probably their loophole. But it is kind of scary when you think about it because, to, not to get too far off the subject, but it's all part of the subject. If I were to come up tomorrow with a little handful device that says, look, we can power every vehicle on this planet at zero cost, it won't go anywhere. Petroleum corporations won't let that go anywhere, and they will kill to keep the oil flow going, to keep the cars going with oil because it's in their economical engine. It's what gives them power. And so it's the same thing with extraterrestrials have a device that they've been trading for humans, whatever the case may be, even if it was just a treaty agreement, and they have this anti-gravity device it's not going to go anywhere unless it's a military use device only for protection. But then when you start getting into managing the population of people, managing the food, who are they? Well, who are these people that think that they are the God complex that they have, that they have that right over us? Again, it's free will. We all have free will and we have the right to say no. How do we get our voices heard and be able to push that back? You know, well, exactly. We, we have the That's illusion. the challenge. How do you push that back? We have the illusion that we have the right to say no, but this is already, if this is already, it was Mike Tyson there for a second, but if this is already in our laws, you know, what choice do we have but to sit back and take it unless we decide to revolt? And if right. the FBI the is law. listening to this, this right. is just a discussion. We're not doing it. Uh, go mm-hmm. focus on the people raiding right Area 51. But, uh, <laughs> You know, the missing people, we touch back on that aside from Agenda 21, missing people. What if those are people are already been taken and colonized other worlds through extraterrestrials to keep the human race uh, populated in case of a catastrophe? We go and I, for my final point, I bring to you the uh, mass abduction in Houston, uh, December 1922. Eight people separately report being abducted, and this was investigated by Daryl Sims. All eight witnesses have collaborating stories. One witness describes a hallway of stored samples of Earth creatures that they say specifically did not look dead, just look preserved. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're kept in kind of like these glass menagerie, and they felt like perhaps they were lab specimens kept for cloning, hybridization, and, and maybe they've done this with people already, too. And uh, so we we talk about that. Maybe these space brethren that we've experienced have taken some of us and moved us into population centers across the galaxy in case the cataclysm does bestow planet Earth, bestow on planet mm-hmm. Earth. It's possible, right? I mean, all of this is It possible. is possible. My big question is, Why? Well, what is it that the human race has over the extraterrestrial race? What makes us that valuable to put us in suspended animation for use later? That is my big why. Is it because we have culture? Is it because we have emotions, love, hate, and joy, and every other melancholy, every other emotional? We, we are able to create musically. We are able to write. We are able to express I don't know if that's the one thing that separates us as a living species in this expanse of a universe that the extraterrestrial would put us in a suspended animation to be farmed later. I don't know. And who does know? Um, Okay, go ahead, Maz. No, uh, Travis, I'm going to let you go first, buddy. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, to that point, uh, in an attempt to give a possible answer to that, this actually goes back to what Maz was saying in terms of that there could be um, extraterrestrials with positive agendas for us and those with negative ones. When you look at humanity, some of us, I believe personally, that some of us w- just want to help other people. So it, it is possible uh, that maybe extraterrestrials, if they're doing this, are taking us to other planets to preserve our population because they're, they're the ones on the peaceful end of the spectrum who really do want to just help us survive. Uh, and then that that could be uh that that's a way to do it um just just a thought but would that message be conveyed to those that are being abducted hey can uh, you hear everything's gonna be okay you know everything's gonna be okay just chill relax you know i don't know except uh, the language i don't barrier. know yeah i don't know 
<laughs> the yeah. length. Well, that's the, that gets back to the point that some people like to or not like to, but some people claim that it's it's a telepathic language or or that they understood each other without really saying anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the point that I wanted to make was, what if they just some of them just do it because it's fun? Maybe they don't think we have anything to offer them. Maybe it's oh, just great. maybe it's just fun. I mean, why do some people go hunting and whether they want to say, oh, I I I make you know, I, I take the venison, I make food, whatever. But maybe some people just hunt because it's fun, because they can. If you can, sometimes people do. Well, it's then how fun. do you weed out those? If you're an extraterrestrial, how do you weed out those? And and do, do you take everybody? Do you take bad souls, good souls, mediocre souls, and you just take a plethora of everything? Or do you kind of weed it out and take only the people that would not harm other living creatures? Uh, who knows? Yeah, but that's giving them just, a lot of credit to be able to have the foresight to know things, right? Like, just we go back to Barney and Betty Hill. My my guest, is, my guest, my guess is my guest e. today T. is uh... is that ETs didn't know much about these people. I don't think they'd have any way of knowing that Barney was a mailman and. Uh, you know, they they were, you know, really intelligent people. Sometimes I wonder, like we do, if it's just the, like Matt says, the luck of the hunt, right? Mm-hmm. They have physical characteristics that are appealing to them, and they think, by God, I could do something with this, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. And it was, and, and that's the thought process solely. Are they children? Are they, there's just so many questions we don't know. And then Travis just spoke, and he and I had a conversation about this just the other day. We assume it's just greys, but if there are many different species of extraterrestrials that visit our planet, uh, and Travis said that just moments ago, competing priorities, and maybe they don't have ways to communicate with one another, and we're just caught in the middle of their their uh, ebb and flow and their tug of war over our species. That's an interesting point, too. So we're bringing up more questions and answers, but we are not in answers type of show we just bring up the philosophical thought process and get everybody thinking on all of this uh so maz you have a thought yeah i just want to say it kind of reminds me of the the old joke you know when the cop pulls you over and you go well that guy was going much faster than i was and you're giving me a ticket for speeding when you're fishing you can't catch all the fish so sometimes you just get what you get Mm. throw the net out there and see what you get exactly Uh you said net, right? I did say net. Throw the net out there and see what you get. <laughs> correct. Okay, yes, just make it sure. Correct. All right, so in order to get you gentlemen's opinions on these abduction cases, I guess we'll go zero as the lowest and 100 as the highest on these abduction cases that are documented and your personal belief in extraterrestrial and abduction. Do you believe that this is actually going on and and i'll i'll start with travis let's get your opinion do you actually believe that these abductions are actually happening from your case studies and research and look into this or do you think no the bigger story is this is all a hoax i think uh percentage wise i would i would say 55 percent likely Uh, i because i i really just haven't looked at enough case studies but i I do believe that extraterrestrials exist. Uh, I I don't believe that all of these abduction stories are just malarkey. I don't believe that they're hoaxes. I think there is something happening there. In terms of uh, the actual agenda, yeah, that's that's for the listener to decide because as we've seen and indicated, we we could talk about that for hours. So I'll say 55% on the abduction cases. Mads? I think I'm going to save my hide for those people who might have thought I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, for me, the only way I would say 100% in this scenario is if I knew for a fact, meaning it happened to me. I can happily report. As far as I know, I have not been with, lifted by a white light uh, out of my bed. It might be because I'm very heavy. Um, I don't know. But uh, because of that, I'm going to go 99.9 repeating all the way percent because I am almost certain, like I, I, I said at the beginning of this, to me, it is far more asinine to believe that it has not happened than it is, just based on the science that we know about the universe. It would be so selfish, self-centered, and typical of the human race to think we are it, that this is as good as it gets. And maybe it is as good as it gets, but there is something else out there. I believe it, 99.9999%. I agree with Maz. 
actually the percentage for my belief in this phenomena is incredibly high 99.99999 percent that people are experiencing something uh that the alien agenda is not going to be solved within the next several hours the listening and conclusion of the consumption of this podcast or anytime soon we're just not there and as this little conversation that's gone for an hour and 26 minutes so far we're no closer to coming up with answers and the only thing we're doing is spewing more and more questions at one another but if i had to go with my gut and it was up to me to make the final decision this is a real phenomena it's happening and we have to stop treating the victims of this phenomena like they're the ones that are the issue let's help them get treated and bring them back to some form of normalcy well, I'll have to uh, stand with at least, you know, two of you. <laughs> I believe that in these abduction cases, I do believe they they do happen. I believe they do happen. I think there are cases of dementia or uh, those that are just looking to get some attention and, and reach out, and this is their way of doing it. However, I think in, in most of these documented cases, especially under hypnosis, that 99.999% of these abduction cases have happened. The universe is too far expansive for there not to be an extraterrestrial life form, whether it's more advanced or not. Now, there may be, you know, millions of other civilizations out there that are much younger than us and don't have devices and tools in order to make communication with us, but I do believe that there are those that do have some sort of way of at least making contact here and doing their free will. So, yeah, I will cite on the fact that 99.999% of these cases as well is very much happening. And I sympathize with those, like you said, Sean, I sympathize with those that are kind of treated poorly when they do come up with their case, because a lot of these people, there may be a lot more abduction cases out there that we just are not aware of because they're too afraid to talk about it. So Travis, you had a closing. Oh yeah. Thought? Just to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, you know, yeah. I can segue into that. <laughs> yeah. First mm-hmm. to clarify in terms of the existence, I I'm closer to take 80 to 90% of the actual existence of extraterrestrials. That was mm-hmm. a quick bit. So, um, uh, in closing, I, I would agree and echo you all that it is very important that we take those who report these very seriously. That's one of the things that's missing in the medical field. I, I think we need to pay attention to what's happening, and we need to, to have doctors and scientists who are actively seeking answers to this uh, if if they aren't already and just covering it up. So uh, uh, if if you're out there, if by chance this has happened to you, please report it to somebody you trust because we, we have to know and, and we have to get – we have to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Well said. Very well said. Throw it over to Sean's plate here and, and let him you know, shovel in the last mouthful of this discussion. Open wide, baby. Let's go. Uh, I don't think I could do it any more justice than you guys have. This has been a really good show. I think it leaves us with more questions than there are answers. And I'm okay with that because this is something that we can't stop exploring and something that we can't stop talking about. There are human lives affected by this and we just owe it to them to continue on with the question what is the alien agenda and folks i'm sorry we have a lot of speculation but we just don't know until we nail a gray down to a table and interrogate the crap out of it we're, we're never going to find out and maybe we won't know the agenda until it's rolled out in front of us guys maybe that's the 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 tragedy of it all. We won't be able to do anything until it's too late. Well, I'm going to take the, uh, the clear jar here. That's from Bickley seal that says extraterrestrial life is real. And I'm going to put it back in Isabella's box here and seal it closed. And for the next time that we have to open it up and pull out another subject matter and make it real, we will do that. So I want to thank everybody personally for stopping by the Super NRML and giving this a listen. And, of course, please listen on your favorite listening platform, but be sure to rate and review because it certainly helps others that are interested in this community to be able to find us. And, of course, you know, feel free to share with your friends, hey, 
I know this great show, and they talk about really cool stuff. So I want to thank each and every one of you personally. Sean? Well, guys, I think it's time that we wrap it up for the night. But, gentlemen, let's let our listeners know how they connect with you. Maybe some of them have heard us tonight and feel comfortable coming to us with uh, their experience. Though I do recommend you go to somebody more professional than us when it comes to this stuff. But Oh, uh, thanks. If Great. They, in case they do, Vance, you start off. Why don't you tell folks where they can find you? Yeah, well, they can find me right here in the studio if they are so inclined to knock on the door. I'll be more than happy to look through the people and see that you're not men in black or a black eyed child and let you in and talk to you. Otherwise, you can find me on Facebook, Advance Amazbit. And uh, of course, feel free to send me a message over there. You can direct message me there if you have any questions. You can find all of us over at the Super NRML Cast on Facebook. And I am on Instagram, Vance underscore Nesbitt underscore N-R-M-L, and you can contact me that way, too. Matt, how can people reach you? Oh, they can reach me on Facebook, taking a quiz to find out what kind of seasonal fruit I am. But also, you can find me at The Art of Maz Adams on Facebook. It is not banana. It is not banana. Uh, So, The Art of Maz Adams on Facebook, Maz Adams on Facebook. Uh, Instagram, uh, Maz Adams Art. That's three words, but really one, just Maz Adams Art. You can find me on Twitter at Maz Adams Art. Uh, And right here, right now, what about you, uh, Sean? Well, you can find me everywhere. I am my name, at Sean Forker, on Facebook, Instagram, and what's that other one called? Oh, yeah, Twitter. I forgot about that for a moment. Google Google doesn't exist anymore, that Google Place, does it? Google Plus. <laughs> Google, Google Plus. Place. So, yeah. <laughs> maybe it would have been catchier if it was called Google Place. I don't know. They're the marketing geniuses. They named their damn company Alphabet. So, uh, there we are. Travis, where can folks find you? You can find me on Facebook.com. Just search uh, Travis Quarter and Williamsport, PA. You'll find me there uh, eventually, probably on Twitter. But for now, uh, just the Facebook or over at the Super Normal page there, the Super Normal Cast page on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and connect, and uh, we'll get to talking. Guys, it's always a pleasure when I get to sit here and talk with you, and we're going to explore more topics next episode at our Dimensional Doorstep. We're going to be talking about creatures of time and space. Thank you for coming along to this week's event. Remember, if by chance you get an odd feeling and something doesn't seem right, don't be alarmed by it. It's just the supernormal.